Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. First, I'd like to thank the ASL program, Department of Linguistics, for making this event possible. This event is co-sponsored by the Wolf Humanity Center. They've also made all the presentations in this year's lecture series, ASL Interpreted, to ensure access to all the deaf community and members. So I just want to thank them for the opportunities and thank you for supporting us. I also would like to thank DHCC, the Deaf Hearing Communication Center, and PCBDA for their ongoing support and collaborations, including this one tonight. Our presenter this evening is Richie Bryan. He was a former teacher here a long time ago. Not that long ago, but he taught here in the past. He teaches ASL at NTID, National Technical Institute for the Deaf, in Rochester, New York. He is a graduate of Gallaudet University and McDaniel College. For the past 20 years, he has presented at ASL deaf related workshops, trained people to become ASL mentors, and is currently serving as a deaf member at large on the registry of the interpreters for the deaf board. He has been a, he is a certified interpreter who has worked in the community since 2000. His present interest is in developing African American storytelling within the deaf community, which relates to our topic this evening. Tonight's presentation is Think Me Nothing, Understanding the Uniqueness of the Black Deaf Community. Hi, everybody. All right. Very nice to see a whole wave of hands around this room. Thank you, Jamie, for your warm introduction. Thank you to Penn for inviting me to come here to speak. Thank you to Wolf Humanity Center for sponsoring this event. I am so excited to be back here in Philadelphia. I lived here for, since from 2000 to 2005, about a five-year span, and it was a very rich experience. All right, to our topic in hand. Think me nothing? And that's how I would sign in black ASL, just like that. Right? You don't think I'm anything? And I want you to have a really rich experience about the black, black deaf community. And we're going to talk a lot about this for the next hour. So those of you that are getting ready to travel to other countries, in all of your planning, as you get closer to your trip, whether it be Europe, Asia, Africa, you name it. Before you go on that trip, you start to do some studying. You're going to read some literature to understand maybe things that are taboo, things that are culturally sensitive. And so we're going to be touching on some of those culturally sensitive topics. The black deaf community is very rich. And it's impossible in an hour to capture it all. But I'm going to give you a brief snapshot of what it's like so you get a better idea. And if you want to immerse yourself more, you're welcome to be a part of our world. It's important.
important that you have some knowledge, respect, and sensitivity for the black deaf community and our characteristics and traits and be very tolerant. Everybody see this quote okay? <laughs> so the point is this of this quote, if you want to learn about a community, you see people that are in your perception, making mistakes, and you start to point the finger, you really need to take a look at yourself. Right? So their cultural traits and way of relating, you know, in my culture, you know, the values, the traditions, you cannot impose your culture on another culture. You have to look at them as equal and have mutual respect. Let's talk a little bit about the community, and I'm laying down the welcome mat for you all to be a part of this journey. It's an amazingly rich and vibrant world, the Black Deaf community. If you haven't been exposed to it, come on inside. So people are finally finding out about the deaf, black deaf community now. But why not before? We should have been having these conversations historically, but they really have not happened until now for, because of several factors. Um, and we're not really happy you know, about why we're not having these conversations frequently. See me just fine where I am? Maybe I should move to the other side and take advantage of the lighting over here. Is that better? Okay. Can you see me sign clearly here? Not as much, no. Hmm. You know, I should have brought like a, a hot pink shirt. You know, something <laughs> a little more loud. Can you still see the quote up here? So I'm going to try to stay here for uh, my presentation, and then when we have videos, we'll go ahead and adjust the lighting, okay? All right. So why haven't these conversations taken place historically? Oftentimes, the dominant culture will frame our culture, our ways of thinking, and try to impose things on us as a marginalized group. Because of that cultural appropriation, we don't hear as much from our culture and community. And this has happened for years upon years. So here we have Niall, 
who's immensely famous as a deaf actor, dancer, and he has so many different followers. So right before this movie was about to be released, in February, people were really looking forward to this movie. And then Niall, with uh, Laurent Ridoff, who's pictured here, Lauren Ridoff, who's pictured here, um, decided to put this on Twitter. They came up, up with an idea about how to sign the title of the movie. And this became blasted out over social media. And so what happened is the deaf black community got very upset. <laughs> because Niall was deciding and Lauren was deciding how to sign things for the black deaf community. And if you watch the Black Panther movie, which is an amazing depiction of uh, culture and all of its implications and, and way of life, so that it was very black-centric. But here, Niall is not necessarily a part of that community. So it was a little bit arrogant for him to go ahead and give it a moniker. And so our community decided, hold on a second, Niall. You cannot make these decisions for us. We decide for ourselves. And the black deaf community came together to talk about these things. Here we have Professor Joseph Hill, who is a colleague of mine, uh, who works at NTID, National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And he um, gathered together thoughts from the community about Black Panther. And he did this over the platform of Facebook. So there were a lot of brainstorming, and they came up with three signs that were acceptable. And here they are. OK, so those are the three that were decided upon that were aligned to our culture. And so what? Um, what Niall had done was really missing all those cultural influences. Oftentimes, black deaf people are asked about their identity. They say, do you see yourself as black? Do you see yourself as deaf, first and foremost? And so sometimes we're asked to ignore our black culture. You know? And we are working for the sake of deaf people. But oftentimes the black community you know, struggles to identify itself. We, we see ourselves as deaf, but you know, not, we might not be necessarily. And so. So black people tend to give up their black identity because they want to be part of the deaf community and be in collaboration. And oftentimes, deaf people will say, like, well, oh, hold on a second. You know, be, be a part of us. You have that affinity. And then later, if they're not needed, then they're just marginalized. So there's been research to look into this, and more and more, we realize that there's intersectionality that takes place. And I'll sign it this way. There are many layers to someone's identity. Looking at me, you see that I'm black. But if I were walking down the street, 
You would never guess that I was deaf. And so you have this idea of what black looks like according to the societal perspective, whether it be negative, uh, criminal. There are many connotations that come up. So now if I also lay, layer over that that I'm a male, that adds many things. And it might be looked at as a predator. Um, and so the news is always telling about these awful things that happen, robberies and rapes, and police put up these pictures of black suspects again and again. And so my identity sometimes is tied to that. And so I'm not seen as, as deaf until somebody tries to address me, and then I say, hey, I'm deaf, and then they say, I'm sorry. And then all of a sudden, my deaf identity comes to the forefront. And oftentimes, the black deaf community identifies themselves first as black and secondly as deaf, not the other way around. Now again, it does depend on the individual who you ask. Some people might say, I'm deaf first and I'm black, or it might be the other way around. So we've gotten into an interesting chapter in our community and our heritage, and that's of black deaf schools. As you may remember, historically, there were Jim Crow laws that really were evident in the South, where segregation happened between the black and white communities. And the same thing existed for the deaf communities. It was no different. And that was very much existent in, in the black, in the, in the South. And so what's so fascinating is with the segregated deaf black schools, because of that dynamic, that led to the creation and formation of black American Sign Language. So this was the birthplace of black ASL. And you might be thinking what that looks like, what are its characteristics, and I'm going to be sharing some of those things tonight. So these are all different states that had black deaf schools that were segregated. Which was the last of these states to finally become um, together, integrated, the Louisiana School for the Deaf. That integrated integration happened in 1977. So here we have the Kendall School in Washington, D.C. I've done some interesting research and found out some facts. When the school was founded, it was integrated. And then over time, there were some parents that got very upset about that integration. And so they lobbied the government to then ratify an act forcing the schools to be segregated. And the black deaf children, they went all the way to the Maryland school for the colored deaf. 
which is uh, up close to where Baltimore is. So that was how it was for years, year after year. And then there was one family that was the Miller family. And they had a couple kids that were deaf. And they lived in the D.C. area. And they wanted to place their child at the Kemp School. They didn't want them to go to the school all the way in Baltimore. So the oldest child was about five years of age. And so sending that kid on the bus on their own was not satisfactory. They wanted to have um, the school in close proximity. So they talked with some other parents and negotiated and, and were very, very steadfast. And they filed an injunction, and they won. Now, what's so interesting about this This is the same case, uh, first case um, of segregation ending, and this predates Brown versus the Board of Education, which was the landmark decision from the Supreme Court. This is two years prior to that. This is 1952. And this is a very seminal event in deaf education history. This is something we should have been talking about, but of, unfortunately, these conversations are not taking place enough. So as you see on the screen, this is Sharon White. And she is a strong advocate at the, for the Black Deaf Advocates. I will explain a little bit more about her later. So she was the president of her, of her chapter in Kentucky. So the Kentucky School for the Deaf had black, tutin, black students that attended their deaf schools. The black students had completed all of the graduation requirements. They passed their tests. They attended school on a regular basis. Everything they needed to do in order to graduate, they met those requirements. So the administrator of the school at that time had decided that the, that the black students were not going to be given diplomas. They were only given certificates of attendance upon completion of graduation. That impacted those students when they went to go to work. Because when you go to work, you need a high school diploma or a GED. Those students had to check no on their applications and were not able to get employment. So this went on for many years that the black students were not given diplomas until Sharon White decided that this was not right and she got involved. And she started to take some action. She then spoke with the Kansas School for the Deaf. She, spoke, she got the Kentucky School for the Deaf, spoke with the superintendents and got that certificate removed and the students were given diplomas. There was a videotape of a gentleman. Um, he may have been in his 70s, and he had got his diploma in his 70s. That's when he finally received his high school diploma. He was very cheerful. And he was very tearful upon receiving that. And that was all from the work of Sharon White. She was given an award from the government because of her work.
historically what has happened is people have looked down upon black signers. They feel that there's something not right about their facial expressions. They have an accent. People just feel that black deaf signers, have, there's just something off about them. So what happened was, the three people that are here on the screen in front of you, which the first part at the top corner is Carolyn Caskill. Her sign name is C on the hip. She is from Alabama. She had witnessed black deaf adult signing. She had, and she had seen this go on for years and years. And what she felt that we need to do some research on black deaf signers about black ASL. Is there, actually, is, there, is there actually a linguistic component to this? So she started to do some videotaping. She started to gather research, get people together, start to have conversations, have people tell stories, start documentation. And then she was able to publish a book that was peer-reviewed that was, was peer -reviewed, and that there is an actual black black ASL. Once the book was published, people in the black deaf community, there was such a sigh of relief, validation. Yes, this is about us. Feedback was given. Findings were given. So the hearing traits of bl the black black hearing, black hearing traits black strongly hearing. infused black ASL. The second thing was facial expression is exaggerated. The third feature was the signing space was much larger. So those three things were consistent upon the information that was gathered. It's not that it, they went to different states, and no matter where they went, they found similarities between the black deaf community. You know, it, didn't, it wasn't like people in Alabama signed this way, or if you lived in another state, you might have signed something else, different features were coming up. They were consistent across the states, mm -hmm. these features of black ASL. So black ASL is a language and has historical roots and historically Black deaf children have been criticized for their signing, and they were punished because of the way the way they had made a facial expression. Often they were punished because over and over and over again, because it was a, because of how they expressed themselves. So now I'm going to give you a few examples of black ASL. These are Texas signs. The first sign I'm going to show you is for cornbread. This is the sign for cornbread. This is cards. Cards. You might be wondering why the sign looks like this, because if you're sitting if you're sitting around with a group of people, often people are putting stuff into like a into like a, a container. So a lot of people mistake the sign for tea. 
it's representative of cards. Pills. In ASL, we typically sign this. Black ASL, you sign something like this. Coming into the second row, laughing. The ASL sign looks like this. Black ASL looks like this. The ASL sign is this for chicken. BSL, chicken like this. The last one, the ASL sign is for coins like this. BSL is like this, black sign language is like this. So starting today, so black ASL will not and has not gone away. It, is, it can be integrated into ASL. When you're talking about signing state, space, you're talking about he hearing culture, the, and those things remain the same. But, and our facial expressions remain the same. Some white people say, well, I've never seen like black people sign that way to me. Black people are very adept at code switching. So when they talk amongst peers, they may talk one way, and in talking to you, they may talk a different way. That is a cultural switch that happens, and black people are very adept at doing that. Often, you know, when you talk with somebody that you trust, you will show who you are. You will talk to them on a different level. And then at that point, you would use more familiar signs, your black sign language. <coughs> So I want to talk a little bit about generational um, generations of black death families. Um, Gallaudets have students that have graduated. I used to be a student at Gallaudet University. And one time I was in the lobby, and a friend of mine was sitting there with me. He was a white deaf person. And the two of us were just having a conversation. And what happened was a, another black deaf person had come up and um, had, had greeted us. This particular uh, black deaf person um, had, a, um, had a large deaf family from Chicago. And the, um, the white person said, oh, I never realized there were a lot of uh, black deaf families. Um, there aren't, I, I didn't think there were many. And the two of us were like, oh, there are a lot of black deaf families. And we kind of went back and forth about the, the prevalence of black deaf families. Understanding I'm from Texas, and um, what? And that was a segregated school. Please don't boo. No, please don't boo. Dallas, I'm from Dallas. <laughs> no booing. Oh, I see I got a fan in the back. Anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm born and raised in Dallas, and in my experience, my classmates had came from deaf black families. So I thought this was a common thing. Like there's a lot of black people that have that are deaf of deaf. So my friend who I had talked had been talking with at Gallia Dead was white, and he and but in the north, and he didn't have the same experience as I did. So I think it's just important moving when you see the videotape which will be up and coming, the interpreters are not going to interpret everything because there's a lot of cultural implication, there's some me linguistic meanings behind different words that the interpreters are not going to be able to pick it up and not do it justice. So what I'm gonna ask the interpreters to do is to just give a brief summary of what the of what the videotapes are, are saying. And I apologize for that if you feel that's not fair. I'm Roy Jones. I was born and raised in Texas. 
I went to a mainstream school and then graduated from the Texas School of the Deaf. I have about 16 to 17 deaf family members in those generations, 16 to 17. My parents went to the Blind Deaf Orphan School. My dad and my aunt and uncle, they also went to that school. My cousins all graduated from the Texas School for the Deaf, as did I. Maybe my nieces and nephews will also graduate from that school. So Roy Jones, I know him his, and his family well. What's important to note about what he said is BDO, the Black Deaf Orphan School. Really, it should have been the Blind Deaf Orphan School. It's one thing I'd like to note about the, the video that we just watched. And that school was in Austin. And that school served three different populations. They had a blind population, a deaf population, and an orphan population. And that was a separate school. That was a segregated school as well. My name's Chandra, and I'm AJ. And we're going to make an announcement. We're going to do something different and fun. Poetry, rap, and dance of various forms. This will be on Monday, January 5th. And if deaf people want to be a part of it, send in your video to this website. And it will end April 15th. We'll be sharing more information on another video very soon. Save the date. See you there. Oh man, you're signing so much English. Come on. Did you see me say that? Seriously? Come on, cut, cut. You think you might be thinking, why did I put this video here? This commercial here. This is an event that's happening in Dallas, and it's a Deaf Action Center, but I have a reason for it. What I want you to see is black ASL in action. There, it's subtle, but I see it there. The features are there. As well as, I picked this video because Roy Jones, who we've seen in the previous slide, is cousins with AJ. That's his cousin, the guy with the beard. As well as Sandra Smith. It, it may be possible that the two of them are related. There's a possibility that they are actually related. smack you right in your face. Oh. You make me sick. You know, I just recorded that, what you just said. You what? Yeah, people are going to see that you, you say you're going to slap me. Oh, yeah. She just said, she just recorded me that I said I was going to smack her in the face. Don't hang up. Ah, ha, ha. Listen, you play too much. That's not nice. That is not nice. It wasn't nice to hang up on me Listen, yesterday. I didn't hang up on you. You did it yourself. You, I said, you said, oh, I'm hungry. I need to eat. I said, okay, fine. I'll talk to you later. I did not say that I was hungry. I oh, man. I did not. 
Oh Listen. my God. Listen, she said, I'm hungry. I said, okay, and I'll let you go. Love you, bye. You are not nuts. Ooh, I never said that. You are lying. God is going to fix you. <laughs> Why are you bothering me? I'm not bothering you. Oh, uh, is that the same shirt as yesterday? Well? Oh. I took a bath. And then I put my shirt back on. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Last night you took a bath? Uh-uh. This morning. No, that's wrong. 24 hours have already passed. You need to change. Oh. You need to wear something different. Where did I go? Where did I go? I went nowhere. I was here all day. You were on Facebook? I was here all day. You're on Facebook now. I'm going to put this up there so people can see you're still wearing that shirt. Okay. <laughs> So this is one of my favorite videos. It's really wonderful to watch three generations of a black deaf family interacting. So you have the, the two older um, grandparents, and then you have the granddaughter that's on this call as well. This is rare to see. You really don't see this very much um, being recorded. So this is really a classic. You're very fortunate to see this being documented. You know, this is an inside look of Black Deaf ASL in action. Now, what's even more interesting, remember we looked at the, the AJ and Chandra? That's their mom and dad, and then the, the, the granddaughter is there is, is Chandra's daughter. So that's her, Chandra's mom and dad. You know, uh, the Philadelphia Deaf community recognizes this person as a, a huge leader in the Philadelphia Black Deaf community for the uh, chapter of Black Deaf Advocates here in Philadelphia. And so I'm putting this up here because Roy Jones and AJ and Chandra are also family members of this family. Remember, we talked about this multi-generation deaf family. And this is a part of it. These three women that you see depicted here are all sisters. They're all deaf. And so you see these cult, this cultural lineage that's been passed along. And I remember growing up, we had Anthony Jones, or AJ, and I would go over to his house and he'd come to my house and his parents were deaf. And, and so my language was really influenced by their family as far as black ASL. And I never realized that until I really looked into it and realized how impactful that was on my life and my language. I wish I could have videoed those experiences. It's kind of a lost history in the black deaf community. So we talked about language use and also um, cultural appropriation. So there's a program called ASL That that's on Facebook. And there are many deaf and hearing people that share ideas and have discourse, whether things are acceptable or not. And there's a community forum where we can really look at whether signs are appropriate or not. So we had a black woman who was signing, I forget the topic, but she was signing away, and then people on that forum really blasted and criticized her, saying that she picked the wrong signs and they weren't appropriate, and really criticized her up and down. And it, it got really ugly, I have to say. So as the community, we suspect that they didn't like her. They thought she signed differently because she didn't follow the uh, white deaf norms. 
And so this was a whole commotion. And so this artist, Yusuf Yahya, saw this. And during a Davia um, art 30-day uh, challenge for the month of February, he decided to do this art piece. And it's very powerful. You see these two young black children, and they're signing. They're evoking something, but they've been marginalized by white people. You can see all the thumbs down on the way they're expressing themselves. My interpretation as a black deaf person, and in my field of research in American Sign Language, is all these thumbs down represent kind of shots being fired, so to speak, at their signing. You know, and it's that power of being rejected over and over again. It's very evocative. show you two different videos, clips, in, uh, about language and cultural appropriation. A very famous uh, storyteller, Dr. Nathy Marbury. As you watch it, you'll see the signing, and you'll see another person, and you'll be able to comp compare their facial features and how they use language. My daughter, who was 10, was with my husband and I, and my 14-year-old daughter, and we were all sitting around the table eating. My husband said, take a look over there. I said, well, what? He said, look. So finally, as we were eating, I said, what, what do you got in your shirt there? Oh, nothing. Really? You sure? What, what, come on, what's in there? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So she was eating really fast at that point. And then she ran away from the table. Mm -hmm. My husband and I looked at each other and said, can you, know, can, you, can you take care of that? So I went over there and I followed her into the bathroom. And I opened the door on her and she said, Mom, I'm in the bathroom. I said, I know, I know. Come on. Well, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And she pulls out a bra. But she really wasn't developed at all. And I'm thinking, okay. I said, well, where'd you get that? Where'd you get it? Oh, a friend gave it to me. She said that I should try it on. Because, you know, I'm developing a little bit, and she, you know, see whether I like it or not. I said, well, you don't have to do that. You're not developed at all. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. I... So I said, well, let me see. And I said, no, there's nothing to be seen. If you had something, I'd go to the store and get something for you. But uh, I said, where did you really get it? Oh, a friend gave it to me. I borrowed it. Come on. I don't think so. Let me take a look at this. This is your sister's. No. A friend gave it to me to try on. Mm-hmm. You sure? You want me to ask your sister? Can you call and ask her? No, you don't have to do that, Mom. Well, why not? Because it's hers. It's hers. Hmm. All right, you tell them the truth. It really is your friends. I think it's your sisters. No. All right, you know what? I'm going to ask your sister. I'm going to call her. No, no, Mom. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I lied. I did. Uh, off 
Now what? When I went to the deaf school, I had a, a friend named Linda Lou Smith, and she's married, and she's got a different last name here, but she's, I saw her last summer, she still lives there. So there was a red ball that we would play with. And I can remember at the deaf school, I was only one of a few black students, probably maybe six of us. And many of the students there had never seen a black person before. So they met me, and there was one leader to the gang, and they cornered me. And they insulted me, and they said that I was dirty, that I didn't take a bath. They said, look at your skin. I said, well, this is my skin. This is how I was born. God made me this way. No, you're just dirty because you take a bath. Okay. No, really, this is mine. You know, you've got white skin and I've got brown skin. We're different. And so they quartered me and they pulled me into the bathroom. And I went struggling, but I was one against many, so it wasn't worth putting up a fight. And they had these paper towels that they would take and then they rinse them in water. And they put, you know that Ajax chemical, the industrial strength ones? They had this huge canister of it. And they put it on the paper towel, and then they kind of raked my skin back and forth to try and scrub it off. And I, it was throbbing, and it hurted, and I was screaming. But that was worthless, because we had a, a deaf supervisor, so that didn't help at all. And so here they are scrubbing my arm and trying to rinse it off with water. And then they looked at me, dumbfounded. And they said, we can't take this off. And I said, I told you, this is how I was born. And it was so red and it was throbbing and they just looked at me. And they wondered. And after that, we just became friends and they had a better understanding that I just had different colored skin. You know, they were naive, just little kids. They didn't know better. I don't blame them. I, you know, maybe their parents never taught them. Maybe that was the problem. And so their first exposure, exposure to a, a black person as a kid, you know, somebody of a different race, was, that was me. And I've got the scars to prove it. Still on my arm from all that Ajax. It's still there. I'll never forget it. And I said it to this one lady last summer. And she said, well, I can't remember that. And I thought, you can't remember it, huh? But I do. <laughs> Okay, so with these two videos, how they're expressing themselves is a little bit muted. This cultural deprivation of not being able to express yourself the way you want to follow the white deaf norms and how to have you know, different conversations. So there are various sign language dictionaries that have been published, but there aren't many people of color that are depicted. It's predominantly white. So if you want to sign fluently, you have to use white ASL, you know, standardized ASL. And it's important to have diversity depicted so that we can have role models to look up to and have more confidence in the way that we sign. Also video relay service interpreting. I've talked with several black VRS users, and oftentimes, when a white person sees a black interpreter, they just cut off the conversation. They just disconnect. And, and it, it really resonates in a, in a negative way. This is a sign language publication um, from a couple years ago. The owner. There are two black deaf owners that own this. Really four, but the two out of the four are, are black. And they've gotten a really good uh, diverse representation that they've uh, documented. I'm hoping we're not out of time. So, I really gathered various black uh, representations of, of, of black ASL lit. And I have a Facebook page um, all about that. And one of my poems 
is connected with this, a dream deferred by Langston Hughes, and the interpreters will not be voicing this. And I'll have the, the text behind me. It's a very famous poem. You probably already know it. And so I hope you enjoy my rendition. I'll be doing it in two parts. First, I'll be following the regular translation, and then I'll be using some uh, artistic license um, with the same poem. So in composing this, the goal was, you know, there are many black deaf children that don't have access to black deaf storytelling uh, or just black storytelling, whether it be African uh, folk, loud, folk tales, and um, they don't have access oftentimes to those things. And so I wanted to build um, a corpus. And so future generations of black deaf children have that access to famous black poems and literature. Um, and that really ties together with language acquisition. And so that's the future project that I'm working on. I know we don't have a lot of time left. Should we go ahead? It's up to you. We've got a few minutes left. I've got just a few more things. We can just go on to the next thing. Okay, yeah, this is, is very important. So this is also a multi-generational black deaf family um, represented here with this child. Um, there are different ABC stories and number stories that are tied into the idea of slavery and eventual freedom um, running away. And so we will not have the interpreter's voice in this, but um, please, Take a look at the beautiful representation, and then there'll be some summary afterwards.
So I'm going to go ahead and summarize what you saw. Uh, this was about uh, uh, slavery and being and running away, and the the torture and experience the particular individual experience from the slave owner, and they ran and that person ran away, and through their trials they arrived to freedom. So that was the point of the ASA story. In closing, I mean I'm so appreciative of being here. And as I talked about previously, you know, this is just scratching the surface. There's so much to talk about. There's all this complexity and intersectionality. And so now, the world of the black deaf community, you've gotten a little bit of that journey. So I want to thank you for having me. So I want to thank the interpreters. Uh, thank you very much. And um, we've got some time for Q&A. If you could come up, please, so uh, that would help with the interpretation. OK? And then also, when we're finished, we can also go out into the lobby to um, socialize. Thank you. If I'm wrong, they can help me out. <laughs> Sounds good. So, my, my name is Carly. I'm an ASL2 student. ASL2 student. How do white people, how can white people help black deaf people? Okay, that's a good question. First, importantly, um, white people as a group need to help one another first before they could help us. Because of the system and how it's skewed in terms of black people, the causes of the system as it is, is the responsibility of white people to fix that system first collectively before we can say what we need help with from you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. So in schools, do you guys, like, are, is black ASL taught, or is it, like, the white ASL, or is, like, the black ASL taught at home? today, we're taught standardized ASL, or I'll call modern ASL. It's not necessarily called white ASL, but it's still pretty white. Now, for black ASL, that happens more often when black people get together themselves. Those features start to pop up during those intermingling. Now, 
teaching and principles and administration, they probably use more standardized ASL. In other words, white ASL. I'd like to add something. Thank you so much, Richie, for your presentation today. It hit home. Um, okay. I didn't know where to look for a second, but I'm on point now. So the, the first student had come up and asked about helping. That word is a trigger word, help. It's a dangerous word because it implies that a person is unable to do. Support and, and pity. Support would be a more accurate word not help. I, I advise you to shy away from that where it is possible. And the, this, is good. I, this is a good representation of black ASL right here. <laughs> Hi. My name is Hong. And I'm a student of ASL. I'm an ASL 1 student. All right. So my question is, Wait, wait, I have to say that loud. Hold on. Okay, hold on one second. So, so hold on one second. Wait, can you hold one second, please? Hold on, hold on one second. So, you were talking about people identifying as black first and then deaf as far as your community uh, affiliation first? So, why not black? that being the same, equal. I don't understand what you mean. E equal? Equal. Why aren't black and deaf equal? Okay. Hold on one second. So why I would say black and then deaf is because that's how people perceive me in an instant. Oftentimes, people make assumptions when they first see me and how they want to connect with me is based on my blackness. And then when we try to communicate, they realize that I'm deaf in a secondary way. And that's why I identify myself as black first and deaf second. I wouldn't say equal. So that's my best answer. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, the presentation was powerful. I was wondering, from, you talked about the black deaf experience, black ASL. Like, if there are people who have mixed race, like black Spanish. The reason why, um, I'm, I'm a linguistic student. And different things come up with people that are black and Hispanic. Do they use black ASL? You're talking about the inter idea of intersectionality, yes. right? Yes, that's what I'm referencing to, yes. OK. That brings up a really good point about intersectionality. When you look at me, I don't just have one identity. I have many layers to my identity. I'm black, I'm deaf, I'm gay, I'm a man, I'm middle class, I'm educated, right? So all of those layers impact how I'm seen as a person and how I relate with people. And so to make just one identity, I'm more than just that. So, 
Okay, hi, so my name is Cass. Um, I'm an ASL 3 student. Um, and I started taking ASL because I'm hard of hearing and I thought that it'd be like useful for me, but I never really got the chance to learn ASL growing up with my family, because my family is not deaf or hard of hearing and didn't like understand or want me to learn how to sign, so they just like taught me how to like read lists. It was, it was bad, it was unpleasant. Um, so I'm wondering now, I'm learning ASL classes, um, and I'm wondering if there's a way that I could like connect with the black deaf community, because I don't really get opportunities like that in this educational setting. So if you had suggestions, that'd be good. OK, so you're very fortunate. You're in the right place. Here in Philadelphia, there's a huge black deaf community, especially the chapter of black deaf advocates. They meet about once a month, am I right? Help me out. The fourth Saturday of every month. So it's it's open to everybody. Will they provide interpreters? Thanks, this Thanksgiving, uh, they're having Thanksgiving celebration November, actually November the 10th. It won't take place. So now you've got somewhere to start. All right. Thank you. I know. Hi, I am Lamira. My sign is Lamira like this. Hey, everyone. I really enjoy seeing all of you. So my question would be, I looked at the videos today, and they hit me. My experience at Temple University has been, uh, well, I'm a freshman, and I'm the only one that's deaf. Everybody else is hearing. No one else signs. And that's a struggle for me. I have worked extremely hard. Most of the students are predominantly white. I am black, and they look down at me and feel that I can't. No matter what it is that I do, I can not I can do these things. I can be independent. So I want to know your experience at NTID, at RIT. What was your experience like? Was it different than mine? Did you feel that it? Did you that you were feel like you were equal? You know, I've never experienced anything like this before. Like you know, with hearing it deaf people in this capacity. Like, what was your experience like in college? NTID, where I instruct. There are various groups of people, some who sign, some who are more oral, some who sign more in English word order. And so there, are, there is a diverse representation of people there. NCID has student organizations. There's a black deaf student organization where if you feel like you need support, um, they get together and meet frequently and also do training based on leadership and build self-esteem. And so I think that's an opportunity um, if you want to check out NCID. Sorry, I'm kind of recruiting here, but. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was amazing. My name is, my name is Ari. And I was wondering, I would be involved in deaf education, and typically the teachers uh, use standardized ASL. How can I support diversity within within my use of language? That's a really good question. One story comes to mind um, about uh, a Mexican deaf family. Their first language is LSM. Sign language of Mexico or Mexican Sign Language. And often they'll be signing as a family, the parents are deaf, and so then when they go to school, the school forces them to sign in American Sign Language instead of using their native language without providing all the support that's needed. And that caused the family to lose some of their Mexican signing, and they struggle with learning English, they struggle with signing the American Sign Language because they haven't been able to build that bridge to use their strong L1 to support second language learning. 
And so the school really should have more training. And to your point, as far as black ASL, oftentimes black children tend to switch, code switch in how they're communicating with. So the kids will communicate a certain way, and then they're asked to clarify again and again and again. And so they're forced to communicate differently, and they hold back. And so for you to improve the situation is to hang out with black deaf adults, to build a receptive competency so that you can kind of have a, there's a scaffolding. So if you're at a certain point, you try to get to the next level, socialize and get to the next level, and bring up your receptive skills so that you can interact more with your black deaf students. Hello, my name is Patrick, and I just want to, I might, uh, a little controversial what I'm going to say. No, I expect that. So I've noticed, and maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, but I've noticed you identify as black first. Am I correct? Yes. And... Black Lives Matter. And with the whole Black Lives Matter movement? Black people being shot. About black people being shot. How do you feel about the about the Black Lives Black Lives Matters movement? And their activism. And their activism. Are interpreters welcome so the black, so the black deaf people can feel involved within the movement and interact with people as opposed to only interacting within themselves and being able to act, be able to socialize and integrate with the larger hearing community? Are you talking about just for my involvement or for the community? I'm speaking about the black deaf community in general at this point. Okay. So I'm thinking the Black Lives Matter movement intends to encourage um, that uh, prejudice and, and uh, inequality to make things more fair for any race, that everybody has an equal opportunity, right, to have due process. Um, you don't need to be have money. And then my experience in, with the Black Lives Matter movement and various events, there was an event in Austin, Texas, that I was a part of, and they did provide interpreters. In fact, they asked for a CDI to be brought in as well, and I was involved interpreting with that. And so it depends on each location. If somebody asks for that accommodation, then that could happen. I was just thinking that for anyone who'd be brave enough to, to, to do it, to ask for it, they may be nervous, um, you know, to have the deaf community involved with the larger community. Well, be a part of it. All you have to do is ask, and they'd be more than accommodating, I'm sure. Okay, well, thank you for your feedback. We have time for two more questions. We've got you. All right, we'll, we'll do three. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Robin Miller. Would you have two questions for you? My first question would be that you had mentioned about ASL, you had mentioned something about ASL that. And I was surprised to see that there are no black representations of Black Panther with that. You know, initially we had uh, white deaf people who, who took it upon themselves to create the sign for Black Panther. Talking about the Nile video that I showed? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Yes, yes. Yeah, I arrived a little late, I apologize. Not a problem. Uh, you're excused. So the language, we're talking about language acquisition for deaf children, deaf black children in particular. And I feel that you need to be able to have them educated and involved. I feel the problem is that starts sometimes with the parents, parents of color, who don't want to, to take more time to teach their children or to interact with their children. What would you suggest how we can bridge that gap between school 
and, and community to get parents more involved in teaching their children language. First, and most importantly, we need to look at the root of the problem. There are various factors involved. My mom was a single mom, and she had two jobs. And she didn't really have a lot of time or resources to go to the school and to learn more signing to communicate with me. So that's one thing. You know the famous quote, it takes a village to raise a child? You know, the Black Deaf community is responsible to become a language model and work with parents and work with families to foster that. And we also need to pressure schools to do better. They need to do a better job in promoting communication access for all children. Hi, my name is Kennedy. I'm a student. I'm an ASO one student. poetry and translate it to black sign language. The question is how I did the translation from the English text to black ASL. Is that your question? All right, so there are several steps involved. First, I always really do message analysis about the author's intent and the meaning the metaphors. And then, I try to really look into the time period where it was written, the 1920s, and what was going on at the time, and what the black deaf community went through, and the black community went through to help me kind of internalize that, and then look further into it in terms of the semantics, all of the meanings and the metaphors, and all of the intent. And then when I look at all that, that's how I do that translation process. Thank you. You're welcome. So, hello. My name is Roxanne Williams. I am a sibling of a deaf adult. So, when I was younger, we learned signs from my brother. And as I grew older, and became an adult, I moved out of town, so my first thing when I moved to Delaware was to begin to volunteer with Delaware School for the Deaf. That was my way of giving back to my brother. And knowing that as a small child, he didn't have a lot of people to sign, but he travels all over the country now. And my way of giving back is to, at work, as a ticket agent um, with Amtrak, I am very passionate for students and passengers who come in and nobody know how to communicate. So that is one of my goals and aspiring to be a, a black advocate for ASL. And I want to thank you for having the, the lecture. I noticed on my calendar about an hour ago, so I immediately got here from Baltimore. So I'm trying to find out how I can do more for myself in between work and all the other things. I am an interpreter with my church, so I sign at church as well as a volunteer at the Delaware School for the Deaf. But I want to pursue it further with education. So can you give me some insight on doing that? Thank you. start off, in your hometown, if you could ask some black deaf people to become 
your cultural buddy to go around with, and this cultural buddy would then lead you to various events so that you don't have to go alone to a kind of strange place with strange people. You'll have somebody, kind of an ally, to go with you. Maybe your brother, um, you know, could be the first person to go with you to start that process and get involved with that world. So we've got one last question, please. Hi. My name is Anthony. I'm an ASL3 student. I am a nursing student as well. And there are three of us in nursing school that are learning sign language of this summer. In nursing school, we learned that, that the black community has, wor has worse health than the white deaf Thank you.